Thank you. You all got quiet at the exact time. Thank you very much. Uh, we may have a sudden influx of people. Uh, the Board of Trustees may be coming in, so if you see about uh, 20, 30 people come walking in all of a sudden, uh, don't be alarmed. <laughs> Hello, I'm George Schmidt, uh, one of the event planners for this evening, along with uh, Bo Eberly, wherever he is right now. Um, I look out and I see beautiful and brilliant people here this evening. All of you sitting in com uh, comfortably in those well-constructed chairs, ready to hear insightful and serious comments, comments which are made audible by very expensive sound equipment. I even see a few hungry faces out there that look forward to those small bite-sized snacks following the discussion. And in this moment, I have come to an important realization. There's a special place in heaven for event planners. Event planners are multi-headed hydras that possess brilliant minds, iron wills, and cool heads. Unfortunately, Bo Eberly and I do not possess any of these qualities. Without the various aid and advice of Hector Batista, Wade Bennett, Fred Davey, Basaru Diop, John Grisales, Melzar Hamill, Serene Jones, Maria Cole, Michael Maloney, Calvin Mason, Kevin McGee, Rudy Hoyos, Michael Orzakowski, Liko Palmer, Katarina Ragusi, and Maurice Samuels. There would be no chairs, there would be no microphones, and no delicious snacks, and especially no insightful comments. It was the case with it with each individual that money, wisdom, labor, love, or at times a hard slap across the face was not only afforded generously, but enthusiastically. A testament to the excitement that was generated by our distinguished speakers. On behalf of Bo and myself, I would like to formally appreciate all of the support. And before I begin with introductions, I wanted to quickly advertise for Michael Roberson's event that will take place this coming Saturday, February 16th at 5 p.m. Where's Michael Roberson? Talk to that gentleman at the end if you'd like to. Um, based on a theatrical reading of the play, The Anointing, Michael's event by the same name is based on his work in the black gay community. His aim is to discuss how theology has impacted the health disparities of black gay men and will feature a panel discussion with refreshments of follow. Now that those two beginnings are finished, I will now begin at the beginning again. So here's the formal introduction. When we all can claim a basic Wikipedia level understanding of everyone and everything, the superfluous role of the introducer, namely myself, is revealed to be even more irrelevant and stupid. For the moment, I would ask us all to forget this fact while I propose a simple question. Two radical political theologians, one teaching at Central Arkansas and the other at Lebanon Valley College, a Princeton seminary professor who coordinates the educators for Mumia Abu Jamal, and a union professor who, when the machines become sentient and enslave us in a false reality, will occupy a laudable seat on the Council of Elders fighting for liberation? <laughs> How did they come here to entertain and edify us in the chapel where Dr. Martin King was originally scheduled to give his famous Beyond Vietnam speech? It began as these sorts of things normally do at Union, with a reading list for a summer research project with Professor Gary Dorian. Bo and I were constructing a list of political theologies a tradition coming out of Germany, and some would even formally locate it in the work of the off-and-off, off-and-on Nazi uh, Karl Schmitt. While we knew we wanted to read foundational thinkers like Spinoza and Rousseau, and I won't bore you with the other pretentious names on the list, uh, we had difficulty finding what we lovingly would call cutting edge. In this sense, we were very much guided by Deleuze when he advises us it's not a question of worrying or hoping for the best, but finding new weapons. Not until Bo's circuitous research found Clayton Crockett's radical political theology did we begin to hope that we found an edged weapon, 
Working through Crockett's unification of apparent opposites, Bo and I discovered rewarding uses of a number of posts, post-Marxism, post-modernism, post-liberalism, and post-secularism. But I felt an absence haunting radical political theology, namely liberation theology. While Europe was haunted by communism, Crockett was haunted by liberation theology. I began imagining Crockett waking in the middle of the night in a cold sweat after hearing the specter of liberation theology rattling chains over his beds, perhaps a banshee moan would scream into his ears. In what amounted to a challenge, which Crockett sought to meet, he quotes Jeffrey Robbins in his essay, Terror in the Postmodern Condition, where he critiques radical and postmodern theologies for not calling into question both the theological and the political order. For Robbins, this is also true of two other contemporary forms of theological thinking, process theology and liberation theology. While his criticism of process theology targets its operation within a, quote, Christian confessional framework that at times falls into a Whiteheadian dogmatics, liberation theology, quote, never went so far as to put the established theology into question. For me, the center of the establishment theology is not only white, but also male. So if the center of the established theological order is properly identified as a white, phallocentric value system, then Robbins' claim seems quite spurious, especially when considering some of liberation theology's more explicit decentering gestures. For example, James Cone's assertion of the ontological blackness of God, or Mary Daly's castration of the, quote, divine phallus. Crockett's sympathy for Robbins' position troubled me, not for its demand for an explicitly death of God theology, because I am with him on that one as it exists in its very for various forms, but for its lack of serious consideration of influential liberation theologians and their ideas. Though Crockett criticizes process theology, he never attends to its theologians in depth. This is not the case with liberation theology. I must say there is an exception to my claim, an exception that perhaps demonstrates the rule. In one paragraph and later one fragmented quote, Crockett employs Haitian liberation theologian Jean Bertrand Aristide to critique liberalism and then to call for a quote, democratization of democracy. While Bo and I found new weapons, I felt there was no deep conversation with liberation theology to be had. Which reminds me of a Ray Bradbury quote from Fahrenheit 451. When I was younger, I shoved my ignorance into people's faces. They beat me with sticks, by the time I was 40, my blunt instrument had been honed to a fine cutting point for me. If you hide your ignorance, no one will hit you, and you'll never learn. Unlike other scholars who are hit by the challenge of liberation theology and promise to never engage with liberation theology or liberation theologians again, Robbins and Crockett seem to love their beatings. As the womanist ethicist Emily Marshall told me, and others at the beginning of her class, quote, this is not a safe space. This is a learning space, and learning hurts. Let's risk a real conversation here in James Chapel. This evening, let us all follow the example set out by Robbins and Crockett and leave some of our own blood on the floor of James Chapel tonight. So please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight's event, Becoming a Brain. Thank you. Thank you, George, for, for setting us up. Um, thank you, Bo and George, for, for setting this up, to President Jones and all the people at Union who made this possible. Uh, this is a tremendous privilege and honor to be here. Um, I would like to thank Professors West and Taylor for their willingness to engage our work, um, to press us where we need to be pressed, and to ask us the questions that we left unasked. Uh, to Clayton, my friend and collaborator for 15 years. Um, my kind of intellectual work with him has been a great source of, of joy, laughter, and, and strength as well. So um, it's a pleasure to share the, the stage with you all. I'm, I'm humbled by this occasion, um, largely as George detailed it. This occasion grew out of a panel at the American Academy of Religion this past year. Um, George posed a question to us there. Um, it was then that I confessed my ignorance 
um, and perhaps a kind of premature dismissal of a tradition of thought that I hadn't engaged as seriously as I ought to. And uh, this, this tonight's event grew out of that, um, that challenge. So I'm humbled by the occasion, by the setting, and most certainly the company. Not only the company here tonight, but the kind of company of angels that I associate with Union Theological. Um, when I was first a theological student, I read the life and works of Bonhoeffer again and again and again, and I always had a special place in my heart for this place. Um, the way in which he was challenged, the way in which he was fundamentally changed, not just by the ideas that he encountered here, but by the setting, by the neighborhood, uh, by the, the, the Negro spirituals that he came to appreciate. Um, he's always been one of my theological heroes, and uh, it's a tremendous honor to be here. So, thank you. So with that, let me begin with a quote from Wallace Black Elk from the Sacred Way of a Lakota. The earth people are rooted in the fire, rock, water, and green. The problem, or perhaps after listening to Professor West this afternoon, the catastrophe. The saddest part for this society is that if we were to go back to this earth people philosophy, there is no money there. The question, nay the blade, with which both the old and new materialists alike begin is a basic one, namely what is really real. It is a question that cuts, whether gods or monsters, heaven or hell, one religious truth versus another. By asking the question of what is really real, certain distinctions lose their importance, if not their meaning altogether. In this way, materialism is a kind of nominalism exercising Occam's razor as a radical empiricism. And as such, it also risks risk a kind of reductionism, creating a fault line of its own between the old and the new, between, on the one hand, a sometimes crude form of thought that confuses or conflates explanations with understandings, and, on the other, a non-reductive approach to the material that is no less complex than the very notion of the earth becoming a brain. But it should be added, the blade cuts both ways. If certain distinctions lose their importance, the, uh, the urgency of others is made apparent, of this world and the life to come, the oppressed and the oppressor. Woman, man, rich, poor, the distinctions are as, are as if in black and white. In this way, and this is a point often forgotten or overlooked, materialism has always staked a moral existentialist claim to ask what is really real is to take on the question of human suffering. As Marx wrote, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And as I was reading these words in preparation for tonight, I was reminded of the occasion of Pope Benedict's uh, resignation today um, and, and remembered how when he first took office as Pope, he announced a, a, a an effort to theologically challenge uh, the, the three isms of the modern age, materialism, liberalism, and secularism, and relativism, excuse me, not liberalism. For Pope Benedict, he wanted his, his tenure as Pope to be a religious backlash against certain forms of materialism, and to his credit, he did announce a, a vision of economic justice that is progressive and much needed. But what we're trying to do in our new materialism, in contrast to this religious backlash against materialism, is an effort to rehabilitate materialism in and for religion and theology. And in doing this, we affirm its historical legacy. The old materialist critique of religion was part and parcel of the most potent and sustained modern challenge to the perceived normalcy of the seemingly inevitable triumph of global capital. The criticism of religion is the premise of all criticism, Marx famously asserted. By identifying religion as the sigh of the oppressed, it unveiled the reality of oppression for the express purpose of changing that reality, of bringing an alternative, better world into place. The old materialism was animated by and used as an instrument in the challenge of liberation. So too with the new materialism. Only with it, we want to carve out a space for 
a theological dreaming, to recognize religion is not only or simply the sigh of the oppressed and a source of solace, but a means of empowerment and one possible mode of political mobilization. And so too with this new materialism, the scope of what constitutes the material has been significantly enlarged. Corporate capitalism remains the most appropriate name, not just as the culprit of alienated labor and exploitation, the target of our frustration or the impediment to our mutual flourishing, but as a constitutive force. There is no outside to global capital. If once we sounded the warning bells of a looming military industrial complex, today it is a mere template. So entrenched it has become almost cliche. Googling the phrase returns not only the military industrial complex, but the prison industrial complex, but also the spiritual, educational, medical, nonprofit industrial complex is. By, by claiming it is cliche, I do not mean to diminish its grave significance whatsoever. Indeed, its prevalence makes us blind to the nearly 2.5 million incarcerated in federal and state prisons, to the one out of 11 African Americans either in prison or on probation and par parole, to the quadrupling of the U.S. prison population since 1980, to the highest incarceration rate in our history and in the world. And if not blind, at least numb to what Naomi Klein has termed the disaster capitalism complex of the corporate estate, wherein elected public officials and cabinet secretaries refuse to divest themselves of their financial interest in a company such as Halliburton that sees a 300% jump in its stock price after the invasion of Iraq. Whether in the case of this overt racism that amounts to nothing less than a new segregationist policy of caging our own, or overt militarism wherein war profiteering is not even prosecuted as a conflict of interest, it is corporate capitalism that is its driving force. Same too with what Croc and I suggest about digital culture. Ever alert to the dangers of a big brother surveillance state, we blandly cede our privacy over to corporate entities with whom we have no recourse, for whom there is no accountability. Not only are we degenerated from citizens to consumers, but we allow ourselves to become the products to be consumed. Capitalist alienation made complete by its digitation and our willing compliance. Add to this question of human suffering the question of the suffering inflicted on the earth, of environmental degradation, of a warming planet alive with cataclysmic storms, a delicate equilibrium out of balance, of global economic expansion and exponential growth that has been fueled almost exclusively in the recent past by our unleashing the stored energy of the sun left dormant for centuries and our carbon remains. What happens when we reach real material limits? Do we yet understand that we are racing against the clock? Without anthropomorphizing the earth, we must ask ourselves the question of what the earth is trying to teach us, or better, what might we learn from the earth? from the devastation we've brought, from the impending climate crisis we've caused, from its plasticity, that is to say, its awesome capacity to absorb our mess, its receptivity, but also its resilience, its capacity to give form, to not only self-regulate or to adapt, but to generate its own habitat, its own atmosphere for survival, its own, just as assuredly as ours. The Earth as a living, breathing, homeostatic system of energy fields and energy flows. This dual plastic potential, which Clayton Crockett and I have learned and appropriated from the work of Catherine Malibu, to receive form and to give form becomes a new material basis for an entire series of geologies. A geology, a geology of morals, a geology of politics, of metaphysics, and logic. And we must add to it her third form of plasticity. Beyond giving and receiving form, the relative balance of a homeostatic system, there is the third form of plasticity, explosive plasticity, the capacity to annihilate form, the death drive on a planetary scale. As the earth becomes a brain, so too might the new materialism contribute to liberationist theologies. A new materialism of the earth that simultaneously recognizes the plasticity of the divine, a theology of a, of a plastic God. As with this rich and disturbing image drawn from Malibu, 
that I'll make two points in conclusion. First, consider the incarnation from the point of view of plasticity, of becoming accidental of the essential, a God who not only gives, but also receives, not only creates, but is subject to creation, to suffering, even to the point of death. Consider this original Feuerbachian, Feuerbachian excuse me, materialist critique also from the point of view of plasticity. The human self-fashioning of God as a projection results in alienation. The cure, therefore, is to recognize religion as a form of false consciousness. But from the point of view of plasticity, we must speak not only of generation and projection as Feuerbach did, but also receptivity and affectivity. The self-fashioning of God is also the construction of the self, and the alienation that ensues is positive, positively revelatory, exposing the very nature of human consciousness as such. No more a dismissal of religion as a form of false consciousness, because all consciousness is false consciousness. No more using materialism to repudiate religion, but to redouble the original material, materialist challenge to make change. So what the Incarnation teaches is not only that God becomes human, but also that God becomes in and of the world, and thereby theology is rendered not simply anthropological, but also political. Second, just as the essential becomes accidental, so too does the accidental become essential. Considered anthropologically, this is the human capacity to take on a second nature by way of habit. This is the materiality of social practices by which we will a self, not a fixed or given essence or nature, but one that has been ingrained by our very own actions, willed before willing, etched in plastic. The repercussions of this for liberationist thought are real and provocative. We see Malibu, for instance, achieving a rehabilitation of the word essence in her discussion of gender and sexuality. It is a critique, albeit a sympathetic one, of the social constructivism of queer theory, whereby the ties between biology and identity have been absolutely severed. It is a refusal of the distinction between nature and culture, or mind and brain. It rests in her ontology of change, what she terms the origina originary mutability of being, there, that there is something more fundamental than difference that revolutionary, emancipatory change is achieved not by a politics of identity, but first and more basically by the recognition that before the difference of identity comes the change of being, being qua change, the change that happens, by which each and every being always and already becomes different from itself, always differing. But this is a different difference than that of Derridian difference, because it is a difference predicated on change. Difference does not operate as a transcendental concept, not even as a quasi-transcendental concept. Instead, it is derived, it's produced. Difference dis displaced by change. The really real is change, by virtue of which difference happens. Likewise, it is a different difference than that which has animated the politics of identity. This puts the moral, political, theological, and philosophical critiques of essence into critical relief. What is it about essence, after all, to which we rightly object? When employed in discussions of sexuality and gender or with race, the problem with talk of essence is that it implies it's associated with and it is employed towards the end of a fixed essence, a naturalization of social norms, an ideological construction that then provides the rationalization of and script for continuing prejudice and oppression. But what if, in contrast to this fixed view, essence is thought of in plastic terms? The differences would be no less real, even no less material or biological, even while being recognized as a product of our own making. Difference has a history, just like the brain, a heritage even. Differences matter. And while real, biological, material, that would need not imply that we are stuck in or stuck with these differences, captive to this history, a perpetuation of the same. Because just as before difference comes change, change never stops. 
without beginning or end, a metabolic ontology that just might be the basis of a new and different liberationist thinking. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. You continue to inspire and challenge me, and I thank you. I also want to thank uh, George and Bo for the invitation and the opportunity to come to Union to be with you here this evening, and for all their labor to make this event happen. And I want to thank everyone else at Union who helped to make this possible. Thank you for your hospitality. And I'm especially grateful to Professor Taylor and to Professor West for being willing to come and join us and respond to our work here tonight. I'm a, uh, my uh, paper is called Energy and Liberation, and I'm starting with a quote from Charles H. Long. Long writes, the basic problems that confront us as a nation today result from the fact that we have not taken the integrity of nature seriously. The exploitation of our natural resources and of blacks and other racial minorities stems from this fact. That's the quote. Being is energy transformation. Energy is convertible with matter at the square of the speed of light. We propose a theological materialism based on energy transformation. This is neither a crude atomic materialism of inert stuff, nor a consumerist materialism based on the desire to acquire more and more stuff. Energy is material, but it is also spiritual. In fact, we suggest that energy helps us move beyond a dualism of spirit versus matter. We call our theology a materialism because we want to work against the idealism that is inherent in traditional forms of theology that posit a transcendent realm of value that is set over against the physical world. We call our materialism theological because an energetic materialism possesses the same power and significance that theology does in more conventional discourses. For us, this theological materialism, akin to what Mark Lewis Taylor calls the theological, offers an insurrection against the dominant forms of theology with a capital T, as well as the predominant form of corporate capitalism and its valuation of life solely in monetary terms. Religion is a form of life. In fact, we cannot prescribe a human form of life that is absolutely or unquestionably non-religious. Theology, however, we suggest is not merely just discourse about religion. Theology for itself is a kind of energy. It is the force of change, of transformation, not just of life, but of being itself. God is not a being, an object, or a person who stands apart from the universe and gives it life and significance. What we call God is being itself, which is the event or change that occurs within the process of existence. Theology concerns the working of this being for itself, which is energy transformation. Our incredible human civilization is based on the exploitation of energy resources. The mechanical revolution in Europe was based on the widespread burning of wood that led to a radical deforestation. The resulting crisis or catastrophe ended up leading not to collapse, but in fact to the utilization of a new and far more powerful fuel, coal which greatly outperformed wood as a source of power when combined with a mechanism, the steam engine. The, this industrial revolution propelled Great Britain to the apex of world power, leading to new forms of military technology, political organization, as well as colonialism, slavery, and the exploitation of peoples. What coal did for the British, oil accomplished for the United States in the so-called American tw century, which was the 20th. The internal combustion engine was the mechanism that allowed us to make maximum use of oil as a resource and the productivity of petroleum far outpaced even coal and natural gas. We need to understand our political, social, and economic situation in relation to energy resources and exploitation. It's not a deterministic causal relationship, but we suggest that you cannot fully understand what's going on without this energy perspective. 
We are running up against real limits of fossil fuels, rare earth metals, arable land, fresh water, and the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb carbon and methane emissions within habitable limits for creatures like us. There is no existence without environment. We have to think and live differently because global capitalism is predicated on indefinite growth and growth is becoming impossible, at least in absolute terms. How can we avoid, is it possible to avoid the either or of on the one hand the infinite extension on the present based on a false illusion of linear progress or on the other hand an apocalyptic collapse based on this or that catastrophic scenario? Take your pick. 1967, uh, I'm suggesting, is the high watermark of hope for political liberation in global terms. 1968 then becomes a tipping point. According to Slavoj Žižek, what effectively happened in the aftermath of 68 was the rise of a new spirit of capitalism. The hierarchical Fordist structure of the production process was gradually abandoned and replaced with a network-based form of organization founded on employee initiative and autonomy in the workplace. This shift toward a new spirit of capitalism coincided with the abandonment of Lyndon Johnson's ambitious war on poverty, as well as an intensification of U.S. military engagement in Vietnam, the murders of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy, the betrayal of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the revolts in France in May 68, and the result becomes the emergence of what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism in her book, The Shock Doctrine. In 1968, I think that we began to experience a kind of energy inflection point where the first time in global terms, humans start to come up against physical, ecological limits as a planet. In 1970, domestic oil production peaked in the lower, 19, in the lower 48 United States, not counting Alaska. In 1971, President Nixon abandoned the, abandoned the Bretton Woods Accord that established the post-World War II economic framework with a dollar that was pegged to $35 for an ounce of gold. After this gold standard disappeared, the U.S. currency became a fiat currency, at least in name. So, <coughs> Excuse me, soon afterward, the OPEC oil embargo, which was a response to the U.S. support of Israel in the Yom Kippur War of 1973, shocked the American economy. As a result, the U.S. affirmed its special relationship with Saudi Arabia, and the Saudis pledged to ramp up supply to fuel the U.S. economy and to sell oil in dollars. In the early 1970, the financial economy delinked from the real economy, which is why the stock market continued to grow tremendously over the next four decades, while inflation increased dramatically and real wages stagnated. The early 1970s also saw the initial awareness of a global ecology, including the famous Club of Rome's book, The Limits to Growth, published in 1972. From about 1945 to about 1969 then, the world saw unprecedented levels of increasing production. Based on the widespread utilization of an almost unbelievable source of energy in the form of hydrocarbon petroleum. The so-called green revolution in the 1950s and 60s was actually the application of petroleum products and methods to agriculture which, in, which produced incredible yields. But, Beginning in the early 1970s, real productive growth began to slow in per capita terms, uh, even as the population continued to increase, and the dreams of utopia in first world nations, as well as hopes for development in third world countries, not to mention the drive for communist revolution in the second, all slowly ground to a halt. Capitalism is based on indefinite growth, but population levels, industrialization across the globe, and overutilization of finite natural resources have combined to make it impossible to grow anymore in absolute terms. If corporate capitalism cannot grow in absolute terms, the only way that it can grow is in relative terms. This is why the rich is, are getting richer and the poor poorer and why we need a new poverty manifesto. And of course we have one, but we desperately need it. This is happening both within the United States and in other countries and between rich and poor countries. It's partly a physical process and we need to come to terms with it if we want our thinking and our actions to be efficacious. It's not simply that corporate capitalists want to crush the poor and steal their money, although that desire is partly intrinsic to the system. It's that they have no choice if they want to survive. 
Capitalism has mutated into a more savage form, even as it presents a more seductive facade because it is consuming its own means of production in a desperate attempt to stave off collapse. That's why we cannot recover from the global recession of 2008. And that's why the US has to spend so much money on its military, which is essentially a police force for global oil and gas pipelines to ensure that this country, which has less than 5% of the world's population, continues to consume nearly a quarter of the world's energy. We need to think more deeply of the Earth because the, beneath the superficial rhythms of capitalist globalization, and it's not just a thinking about the Earth in extrinsic and instrumental terms. And it's also not a mystification of Earth that imagines a kind of simple harmony of life that never existed. Earth is a complex, self-organized system, which is what James Lovelock intended when he named it Gaia, a provocative name, although he was ambivalent about some of the implications of that personalization. We, uh, Jeff and I, have drawn philosophically on the ideas of Hegel, Deleuze and Malibu to help us think more radically about the Earth, as well as some speculative research into how Earth generates its own magnetic field. Like us, Earth is a precarious but relatively stable form that is sustained by energy flows, and it exists in a state that is not a simple equilibrium. The science of non-equilibrium thermodynamics helps explain how we think about energy. According to Eric Snyder and Dorian Sagan, we need to reconceptualize the famous second law of thermodynamics in terms of gradient reduction. It's not that systems simply proceed from an ordered to a disordered state in linear terms, with the result being heat death. It's that nature works to reduce a gradient differential in the quickest and most efficient way. Most of the time that process leads to what we perceive as death, disorder, or equilibrium. Sometimes, however, in highly specific situations, this production of entropy as gradient reduction leads to what we perceive as structure, order, or organization. Structures persist so long as they continue to degrade gradients by means of thermodynamic energy flows. Heat is generally a byproduct, but it's not intrinsic to the process. We need to think thermodynamics in less thermal terms. We are burning up the planet because our orientation to fuel means burning a resource to generate power and therefore giving off heat, emissions, carbon. Yes, inside the Earth it is extremely hot and more and more so outside, but maybe that's not the essential thing. What if our magnetic field is being generated by nuclear reactions that give off a magnetic moment that then gets paramagnetized by the motions of the core and the mantle. What if electromagnetism is the essential force here? We don't, know, we don't know yet what a magnetosphere can do. As complex, multicellular living beings, we are subject to destruction, decay, and death. We are intelligent social beings who organize ourselves into complex hierarchical societies that are capable of sublime achievements and incredible exploitation and cruelty. We do not persist as individuals, societies, or species, however. Our forms are temporary. Energy is conserved always, even though it changes form. We don't know where energy comes from, even though what we call, or what physicists call, dark energy makes up more than three quarters of everything we know of. Liberation from death is also liberation from light. You don't get resurrection without crucifixion. We need an insurrection of theology itself. We need critical and affirmative energies of all colors, genders, sexualities, nations, and beings in order to make this work. Alone, I can only fail. Together, we might succeed in liberating something more than we can realistically hope for. Thank you. From these first two presentations, you know why this is an interesting discussion, and you know why I find it an honor to be here and included in the discussion. I am glad to have encountered the works of Clayton Crockett and Jeffrey Robbins, and already I have some answers to my questions. I'm also honored to be doing this with uh, 
uh, Dr. West, whom we're already missing in Princeton, and I'm sure you're already enjoying his presence. As we were talking beforehand, I first heard him when I was a PhD student at the University of Chicago, and he was a incandescent speaker at a conference that I was the gopher uh, grad student for. Uh, it was a great time, and over the years, I have not only learned from those lectures and that intellectual acumen, but I've learned something from Dr. West about being a human being. And I'd like to just acknowledge in, in presence the, the fact that he is an open person towards students. He taught people around him how to listen and to feel listened to and to put a larger struggle against himself. I was organizing the National Constitution Center event for Mumia last December 11th. He anchored it for us. It wouldn't have happened. We couldn't have held on to that venue, which is a classy uh, venue right in the heart of Philadelphia uh, in the Myth of America Mall. We couldn't have held it without Cornell saying, yes, I'll be there. Um, and so we could, we could keep it that way. But then he sat there through the four-hour program <laughs> and waited for his turn to speak as the closer. And we couldn't go over 11, 11 o'clock without spending an extra $7,000. So it fell to me to say to Cornell, can you keep it to 10 minutes? <laughs> and he said, don't worry, I can say everything that I have. Up to that time, he applauded everyone else. And if you know anything about organizing, you know every ego wants their time. Um, I was impressed by that display of a very basic humanity for justice, and it was exemplary to me. I argue for a political theology not because we need an already constituted discipline, theology, its guild status, I denote with a capital T in my last work, to then address political problems. Instead, I've long held that theology, whatever its subject matter, God, Christ, church, social justice, existential concerns, nuclear issues, the earth, is always already political. It has a politicality. Its discourse is inscribed in a complex play of public forces of social antagonism linked to our experience of the earth. Political theology at its best is theological discourse, always mindful of its inscription, embeddedness in earth and in social antagonisms. These latter generated by assemblages of social constructs, class, empire, race, gender, sexuality, and nation. And in many ways, what I'm going to be asking tonight is how these social assemblages are theorized and theorizable in the view of complex energy emergence that these scholars put before us. I'm closer to many of the theologians than who seek critically to locate their work in relation to the multitude theorized by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, already, although I have my criticisms there. And I state my support of their vision, which enters into Crockett and Robin's books at point with one major proviso, that theorizing the multitude that might bring change occurs across a major historical antagonism, which has multiple axes. And I think especially of the colonial difference and the different modes of conflict that have made that up, especially race, which according to Jürgen Osterhammel, one of the premier theorists of colonialism, has been the difference marker par excellence. The radicality, the going to the roots of my political theology is no mere radical questioning of God, asserting a death of God. Such may be necessary. I'm ready for that. But there's a deeper radicality that grows when political theology's roots drink from the synergy of popular arts and social movements of liberation that take place and take aim at revolutionary activity. By revolutionary, I follow Joy James in seeing the term as referring to a work and way of being that is distinct from radicals and insurrectionists, even when we share the same progressive desires to end military, racial, economic, or sexual domination. As James puts it, revolution encompasses and surpasses radicalism and rebellion to pursue a greater objective. Freedom safeguarded by institutions, revolutionary politics seeks to build new structures and norms. 
and hence revolutionaries are often more feared than radicals or even insurrectionists by governing structures and elites who often feel they can control those occasional outbursts. Martin Luther King became a revolutionary when he gave that famous speech at, against the Vietnam War. As one White House counselor put it, he was throwing in with the Hanoi Hawks, and he raised the specter of a coalition with the anti-Vietnam War movement, a coalition with black power, even with yellow power, the Asian American political that threw in on the West Coast with red, brown, and black power there. The White House itself feared governmental overthrow with that kind of comprehensive coalition on the rise. The kind of political theological that I refer to then may be found in the artistic and political movement work in secular as well as multiple religious settings. And Christianity has no corner, no premium on it, although as I've tried to show in my work, it does make a distinctive contribution. But now to Crockett and, and Robin's manifesto, Religion, Politics, and the Earth. I'm going to offer one major claim and then four supporting propositions and see if I can sustain my claim. The claim is this, that if the new materialism offered by Crockett and Robbins is to be liberating, pointing to a revolutionary future, which in James' sense I would grant them they are aiming towards, it needs an even more deeply dialectical and more materialist turn. I don't think it's there yet in spite of their claims. By a more deeply dialectical project, I refer to a need for their project to theorize a more multiform and inherent structure of violence in the Western project, in what Foucault called the Western episteme that was made possible by its encounter with the rest of the world in a colonizing project. I heard them list off a number of the multiform aspects of the violent West. I am pressing for clarity on how to theorize these um, aspects of the structure of Western violence. And by a more materialist project, for starters, I'll quote Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, although a different one than the one they quote several times in their book about the need to change the world. I'm thinking of numbers one and six. I think their project needs to be more prominently aware of and insert into their respect for the powers of the earth and in the multitude that brings change what Marx termed the ensemble of social relations from thesis six that organize and structures human sensuous activity and practice. This ensemble of social relations has long been configuring, enforcing, enshrining a brutal Western project. It needs to be attended to. And while often this ensemble of social relations has taken up all that we mean by the materialist, and that is problematic too, especially if it's slated attention to the earth and to the environment, I'm asking where are the social relations, this ensemble of brutality in the unfolding of energy that Robbins and, uh, and Crockett um, put forward. Without this, Crockett and Robbins offer an admittedly inspiring and fascinating treatise on a new materialism, a radical theology, but it stays all too much, I wonder, within the circles of an earth-centric cooperative developmentalism, if I could use that phrase. This is not the developmentalism of neoliberal capitalism and globalism, of course. We've heard them distance themselves from that. But it strikes me like perhaps it can be co-opted by it without further reflection on how becoming a brain and insertion into the earth and the politics of the earth and its energies, without clarifying the status of what Jacques Rancière called the part that has no part, those frozen out so often by structures of antagonism. So here are my four propositions, what I'll, which I'll put forward briefly that I think um, undergird my claim. First, it concerns the a-thermal age and political power. Crockett and Robbins' two chapters on energy, really the high point perhaps, co-written with the expertise of Kevin Maggett, and which portray eloquently an inspiring future for energy production of the renewal of the earth, 
nevertheless displays this developmentalist sensibility. Let me try to say what I mean. The themes here, of course, are mighty and insightful. You heard some of them from Dr. Crockett. Our present problem is one of excess heat created by current modes of energy production. They lucidly show how Western-dominated humanity has now reached the point of peak oil. They expose the Industrial Revolution and the contemporary world's unthinkability apart from exploiting cheap oil from the earth. They call for an end to this era of homo carbonicus in a future that thinks beyond heat, replacing carbon and hydrocarbons with another mode of energy. All this on the way to a grand proposal of a, quote, off-thermal technique using fertile and fissile nuclear elements to harvest electricity in a new way, end quote from page 98. I'm summarizing this in part to see if you feel like I'm understanding you. And so they beckon us to cross the threshold, quote, beyond our adherence to a thermodynamic model into a new energy paradigm where we learn to, quote, model the earth, end quote, deriving energy in an off-thermal way, a carbon-free way. We are told of a, quote, all off-thermal nuclear electricity generator, even, that harnesses for humans a way of the earth, whereby we tap into the earth's, quote, highly structured magneto-hydrodynamic fluid system, close quote. I would say to all this, let it be so, bring it on, it sounds good, even though I must await other scholars trained in these areas, physicists other than those they cite, to better assess their claims and their confidence in this future paradigm. But here, let me register my first suspicion about what I see as the developmentalist sensibility here. There's precious little sense of how alienated structuring of power is related to the transition that they foresee and urge, how energy's availability in a coming age of off thermal energy will deal with exploitation of labor, of brutal division of humans, and so on. Indeed, the two writers are aware of this and also name at several points the genocidal epidemics, exploitation, and enslavement of native peoples that characterized the Industrial Revolution, driven by carbon man, homo carbonicus, as they call it. But my question is this, will homo nuclearus, their name for humanity in the new off-thermal age, in itself be able to avoid what homo carbonicus was, i.e. fundamentally also homo brutalis, or the global and local ways of being homo hierarchicus in a destructive way? How will that happen? There's a kind of this hardly works, but I kept writing in my margin. There's a, something like a naive developmentalism here, a giddy confidence in the project of Western cognition that is reminiscent of an earlier naivete and presumption in the West that liberals and progressives have manifested. I actually hear maybe uh, Reinhold Niebuhr of Moral Man and Immoral Moral Society um, uh, rustling at these words. This is apparent in particularly telling language, I think, where Crockett and Robbins portray their radical proposal as, quote, merely the next step up the energy grand staircase, close quote, page 109. I guess my question could be sharpened here as I leave this per first proposition, and I hope I'm not uh, being too cheap here, but with the next step up the grand staircase, whose bodies might remain or become stepped upon? Who does the stepping up? Who the stepping down? Or is this no longer a threat in the off-thermal age? How will social and political powers need to be developed and thought about in this onward and upward move along the energy staircase? A more dialectical, materialist sensibility asks and would address questions like these, I think. My second proposition then, politics and enmity. Let me here move back to chapter three that they entitle Politics, because here one might expect some address to this question about the politics involved in the proposed future development. My proposition here is this. Crockett and Robin's notion of the political, which they rightly and carefully distinguish as the politics of the people, not politics as a state form, might have addressed the question of how hegemonic power is to be addressed in the off thermal age, but instead, they point toward, in very general ways, it seems to me, a radical counterpower, power, 
that they call a multitude, following Spinoza and Antonio Negri, that taps into, quote, the actual cooperative activity that already makes the world go round, close quote. This is people's politics as imminent force, which they develop from Negri and Spinoza again, that they see as a revolutionary power that can be found in the insurrectionist sites like the Occupy movement's reclaiming of public space. In this chapter, I welcomed and celebrated the way they leaned toward Negri and Spinoza and away from Carl Schmitt's political theory, which is the starting point for much continental political theology today and also underwrites much of neoconservative politics in this country, especially their challenge to Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction as some necessary pivot point for thinking the political is rightly challenged by them as perverse logic, and they enlist Derrida's critique of Schmitt on this point as well. But I want to ask, is it adequate to turn away from Schmitt's claim that the friend-enemy distinction is a requirement of political theory and theology, then to affirm Derrida's further point that the enemy is oneself, and buttressing all this, as you seem to do, with a new turn to Augustine's confession, putting the self in question again. All the while, of course, I understand as authors, you are trusting to that spinocistic multitude that taps into the imminent power of the people, the potentia, moving again in according with the earth's going round. Why do I find this somehow insufficient? I guess I want to know where and how do we theorize the structures of enmity that may persist in the oneness of the complex energy emergence. I sometimes tell my students when they construct easy fusions of liberal notions of progress with Christian claims that Jesus' admonition to love the enemy assumes that there are some. Without a phenomenal world where antagonism is a resilient force, the famous love command here loses its very point and difficulty and challenge. So how do we think structural enmity? And is either the notion of the enemy being oneself or of the imminent force of the multitude specific enough to address, say, women who encounter the disguised and not so disguised misogyny of hegemonic masculinism or people of color in this country facing structures that routinize outcomes to their disadvantage generation after generation, radicalized today in the new Jim Jane Crow anchored by a runaway U.S. mass incarceration system that you rightfully and helpfully cited. Then consider the decades of democratic movements in the Middle East targeted as enemies of the U.S. and transnational projects and then so brutally repressed. Um, how do we theorize these moments where structures at play in the Earth's unfolding have targeted other forces as en enemies and then sought to destroy them. I think the new materialism offered here needs more of an antagonistic notion of oppression than we are given. To be constructive, I would like to see the authors give more attention to agonistic and antagonistic theory in politics and political philosophy without stepping out of the non-dualist turns to energy. I've summarized a number of these in my discussions of the agonistic political in my book, The Theological and the Political, and they include Andrew Schopp's Law and Agonistic Politics, Ron Sear's Disagreement, Chantel Mouffe's The Return of the Political, Enrique Dussel from Latin America in his Ethics of Globalization, Vincent Mudimbe and Nachil Mbembe writing out of the African context. And then there's the black intellectual tradition taught and embodied for years by Dr. West, who's here, but many others as well. Angela Davis's early lectures on philosophy and liberation. Uh, Joy James already cited works on violence in the state and many more. Some sources like that seem to come in, need to come into play, it seems to me. And then proposition three, being and antagonism. Here we come to the material of the book that has birthed the phrase in our evening program title, Being a Brain. Um, Crockett and Robbins, at the heart of their new materialism, offer a claim that being in energy transformation and that this also entails becoming a brain. Here I will treat of a matter I see extending across chapter eight, being a brain, and chapter nine, logic. See if I have this right. 
Being a brain is a kind of shorthand, not for literally becoming that organ, but if I could put it this way, for human minds and bodies together entering into the unfolding and continual becoming of complex energy, fully material in nature. They explain that their notion of brain as related to energy is similar to how Heidegger related the notion of A being to being, capital B, in his being in time. My problem with all this lies not in the call into being or becoming material in nature, but here, my third proposition is that, again, it seems to me, this affirmation of complexity and being a brain in the full complex way they work it out, insufficiently builds into its complexity of energy the complex formation of socio-cultural emergence and hence again of the political structural powers that repress and that must be countered with socio-political movement structures. Most of the theoretical language is heavy into the developing notion of evolution, of times evolving and of matter being unfolding in time. The brain that is being in this way is marked by plasticity and this is the brain making history that is freedom, as they say, that's a quote. I want to ask, is that not too easy? It is not only a trust to evolutionary unfolding that we find here that is problematic, but also a discourse that speaks, as they do, of, quote, self-emergent complexity. Perhaps to read this charitably, what they mean by the self that emerges complexly are socialized selves and sociocultural.